Now here's the problem. It takes three years to build a pipeline. Right? So if I use a build to order system, then you wait three years. Then it takes a typical five years minimum occupation period before the flat is available in the retail market. And what do we do with approximately 140,000 new permanent residents in the last two years? What do we do with approximately 40,000 new citizens in the last two years? All these people are, well, in a sense, they're not accounted for no? because your BPO is only for citizens. Now, the National Development Minister's answer was something. All of a sudden, he reviewed the statistics that nobody knew before. And there was, at one time, we had 31,000 unsold flags. Oh, we had 31,000 unsold flags, and nobody knew about it. I'm referring to the United Nations International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. You see, under uh, Article 11, we talk about the right of citizens to housing. So what is the problem? The problem is, despite people asking almost every, uh, every other year in Parliament, and people asking the forum pages every other year, the HDP has consistently refused to provide the breakdown of the cost of using a city site. What is the construction cost? What is the land cost? The refuse to do so. We have one of the highest housing loan delinquency rates in the world. As of September last year, about 7% of all HDP construction loans, which was 30,770 HDP loans, were in areas over three months. This lack of transparency over the pricing of public housing and the amount of profit made by the government has undermined Singaporeans' access to affordable public housing. It is also a failure with regards to the accountability and transparency of the national housing policy. The access to affordable public housing is regarded as a component of people's economic and social rights by the United Nations as provided under Article 11 of the ICDSDR. By the way, Singapore is not a signatory to the convention, but regardless of whether you are a signatory to the convention, this would be the international standard as to the obligations of governments and citizens in regards to public housing. In December 1991, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights clarified this interpretation of one of what constituted the state's obligations with regards to Article 11, it said in paragraph 8 of the General Connect 4, steps should be taken by state parties to ensure that the percentage of housing-related costs is in general commensurate with income levels. So here is the first problem that we have. The way our housing is priced, not to mention the non-transparency, does not commensurate with income levels. The following are some of the key definitions and clarifications of the right to adequate housing as stated in the fact sheet. And our clarification as to how Singapore's public housing policy may be infringing on this right. Paragraph 1A, affordability. Housing is not adequate if its cost threatens or compromises the occupant's enjoyment of other human rights. Clearly, so, yes, the statistics show. Singaporeans contribute the most in the world to their pension when they work, 34.5%. And yet many studies show that when they retire, they also retire with one of the least, the lowest replacement income ratios in the world. In fact, the Longevity Insurance Committee report estimated that by 2013, only 60% of active CPM members would have at least 67,000 in their CPM account. So, that's what I mean by housing is not adequate if its cost patterns or compromises the occupants' enjoyment of other human rights. Rising public housing prices could, in some cases, force people to make choices between housing and other basic needs. Very long paragraph, but in the gist, our problem is that we have no idea how cost effective we are because there's no transparency of how the cost are determined or whether any profits are made. Therefore, A, National Accountability and Monitoring. Accountability compels the state to explain what it is doing and why and how it is moving towards the realization of the right to adequate housing for all 
and explanation here in effective here as possible. International human rights law does not prescribe an exact formula for domestic mechanisms of accountability and redress. At the minimum, all accountability mechanisms must be accessible, transparent and effective. We fail on all three counts. The government's lack of transparency in terms of pricing policy fails to meet this obligation to be accountable. So to summarize, how do we hold the government accountable in relation to the right to any person when there is no scrutiny by anyone? The government's lack of transparency in terms of detailed housing data, such as detailed figures on cash over valuation levels, cost of constructing public housing, fails to meet this obligation to allow democratic processes and independent actors to participate in policy monitoring. The result is a lack of accountability. Now next I'm going to move on to talk about affordability. All the statistics cited about affordability actually again like the boxing ring they are fighting in different forms. People only use 25% of their income to pay. But they use the data of only people who apply for flats or people who already have homes. So it makes sense, right? If I cannot afford to apply, right, I will need the data. If I, if I really cannot afford, I will give up the, the property, the HDB flat. I will also need the data. So if you take only the affordability based on people who apply for foreign flat, it will always be affordable. Even the day comes when I think if you guys buy million dollars, it will also be affordable because only people who afford million dollars to buy. Use only those buy to check on affordability, it will always be affordable. We do not have regular, we do not have regular statistics on how many HDB housing loans are in the area for more than three months. How many HDB flats have been compulsorily acquired? How many HDB flats have been forced to sell in the open market? You see, you cannot pay your HDB mortgage. HDB will come and tell you. If I acquire your plan, I only pay you 90% of valuation. So they in a way force you to sell in the open market. Because you sell the open market, you have 100% of valuation and get cash over valuation. And that's why the HP always say, oh, there are hardly any plans that cannot pay that we compulsory acquire. Of course, because at 90% who will let you acquire. And yet, you still get about 1,000 over plans acquired over the last few years. There are also no regular statistics on HDB bank loans that are in areas. HDB bank loans that are foreclosed. Now they have a HDB lease buyback scheme. So if you have a two or three room flat, you sell it back to HDB, you leave them for 30 years, after 30 years, the HDB will take the property. Does it make sense? Actually, it doesn't make sense. You know why? In a normal reverse mortgage, I take $500 a month. I pay after 30 years 400,000. Assuming my HDB flat grows in value like in the last 40 years, this is about 5% of the number. A 200,000 plus flat will become almost 900,000 in 30 years. So in the normal reverse mortgage offered by commercial bank in other countries, they just take the market value, net off the amount you have been drawn every month plus interest. And the difference is 400,000. So in a sense, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that in the lease buyback scheme, if you compare to a normal reverse mortgage in other countries, the HDB is making 400,000 on every flat that is done on the lease buyback. And what I was saying is that the poor Singaporean who is giving up the lease is actually losing up 400,000 on his equity. So when you look at HDB as an asset enhancer, you have a problem. And that is, the firm has mentioned, if you sell your flat, then you want to downgrade. After paying for the downgrade, how much money do you have? You did not. As long as prices keep growing as they are today, the differential is so little that you probably wouldn't be able to make very much out of it. 